Hey guys, welcome to the video on energy and pyramids. We're going to talk now about how we take the concept of a food chain or a food web and how do we figure out how much energy is actually being transferred from the bottom of the food chain, such as the producers, all the way up to the tertiary or quaternary consumer. All right, so let's get started. We first are going to start with this idea of systems, okay? So there's two types of systems in the world. There's something what we call an open system, which allows all energy and matter to cross different boundaries. So anything can enter and leave. Or we have what's called a closed system, which only allows energy to leave, but no matter, okay? Now you're probably thinking, okay, what's the difference between the two? And let's give an example. An open system is something like an ecosystem. You can have animals enter and leave an ecosystem as they travel around to different territories, to different habitats, okay? Energy is things like the movement of uh, the energy from the herbivore to the carnivores, or it could be the cycle movements of oxygen and carbon dioxide. All of that is open. It can move all around and be transferred around, okay? It's not set to one point. A closed system allows for the movement of energy, like sun coming in and then the creation of photosynthesis and stuff like that. But anything that is in that system that is living, such as like bugs or anything like that, can't leave the system. So that's what this one is an example of. This vial right here of us growing fruit flies is an example of a closed system. Things cannot leave that system. They are stuck there, okay? They will eat, reproduce, and die right here. Okay, where this ecosystem is open because they will eat, reproduce, and die, but they can move to and from and all over that ecosystem. So how do we have energy actually enter our whole biosphere? Okay, well, first of all, you know we need energy for the following things. Okay, to move, to grow, to maintain anything that is a body process, like cellular respiration, for example, and to reproduce. Oops, sorry guys. So in order for energy to be used, we have to have it enter into the biosphere. So where does it come from? Well, we get it from our macromolecules, such as carbohydrates, okay? We then have plants create it, energy through photosynthesis, and then we use that energy and create more energy in cellular respiration. So that is where energy comes from. That is why it's important to understand the process of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, because it is where all energy for all life is coming from. And it's so connected because we are passing it from one to the other. So... Energy from photosynthesis is the energy for cellular respiration. The carbon and water that's produced in cellular respiration is again for photosynthesis. It's just showing that connection, guys. If we cannot make energy in cellular respiration, we're not creating the byproducts that drive photosynthesis. No photosynthesis, no plants, no plants, no energy. So let's take a quick look at the producers, okay? You have to understand something about the sun. Okay, the sun's radiant energy from space coming down to earth is very, very, very strong. The issue is, is we have our atmosphere. We talked about it as being part of our biosphere. It actually stops most of the sun's energy from entering into our level of the atmosphere down to the uh, hydrosphere and the geosphere. Okay, 30% of our sun rays are actually bounced off of the earth and sent back out into space. Okay, 19% of them are absorbed by clouds. 51% of it is absorbed into the Earth's surface. Only 1 to 2%, and this is key, this idea right here that 1 to 2% of the Earth's, of the sun's energy is actually captured by the producers. 1%. So the sun is energy for all producers, and we only use 1% if it's actually an actual energy, okay? So that supports all life on Earth. So think of how small that number is and how much it supports. So when we don't absorb energy, this is a definition you will see. The word is albedo, okay? Think of uh, an example of white clothing, okay? White clothing reflects energy away. Okay, albedo is the amount of reflected energy. So how much are we bouncing away and not actually absorbing? So when it comes to our biosphere, okay, the earth has the same supply of matter today that it had for the last billion years. And that is because we cycle things and we reuse them endlessly. Things die, go back to the soil, the plants use the soil, they grow up, we eat them, we die, we put it back into the soil. It's all about this connection of cycles. There is a difference between a cycle and the flowing. So matter, animals, plants, they cycle, okay? 
they cycle, they die, their and their their physical matter is put back into the ground. Like I said, we reuse it. Energy, though, is only a one-way path. What we eat, the energy we receive from it, we use, and if somewhere were to eat us, they would use the energy from us. It gets passed up. And it as it gets passed up, it gets less and less and less. So it's not cycling all the way back. It's actually, as we go up the food chain, becoming less and less and less. So we know the first law of thermodynamics states that we cannot create nor destroy energy. It has to be transferred. And that is exactly what is happening to our uh, food chains. This is a person of an example of a person, okay? If they bring in five units of energy, so they ate a hamburger, okay? They're gonna store one unit of that energy and then they are going to give out one unit, four units of that energy. So overall, five units are used, but only one is kept, four is transferred out. Transferred out how? Well, heat, uh, waste, and eventually if somebody ate us. The second law is stating that we cannot uh, conserve it 100%. Most of energy is lost to heat. All right. So here's an example of a bear, okay, utilizing all the energy that it had. Okay. When we transfer energies between trophic levels, it varies depending on the organisms. We usually have 5 to 20% from one trophic level to the other, which means we keep and use 80 to 95% of the energy. Okay. And we don't transfer that out. We keep it, we don't give it away. So we call this the rule of 10%. We take the average and we say about 10%. What happens is, is when we pass energy through a food chain, we only give away 10%. So if the grass is 35,000 kilojoules, only 10% of that is going to be available to the deer. That deer has 3,500 kilojoules, only 10% is going to be available to the coyote at 350 kilojoules. That is why trophic levels like a tertiary or a quaternary trophic level, they have to eat so much food because they gain so little energy because it's being lost to all the things that animals need to do. Go to the bathroom, make babies, uh, sleep, utilize it for heat and all that stuff. So as we look at how energy is passed, you will remember that there was the rule of we only use 1% of the light e sun's energy, okay? So a thousand joules of light energy comes in, we are only going to take 10 per joules and pass it on. Why? Because we, the plants only use 1%, okay? The rest of it is lost to the environment or used by the animal. From that 10 joules, we're given one joule to the, ta to the lion, okay? Nine joules of that energy are lost again to the environment or to the animal. That ant lion is not getting eaten, but it uses the rest of the energy to make its own energy. So when it comes to this, we are going to look at the pyramid of numbers. So we've talked about how energy transfers through. Now we need to look at it. How can we depict what we are seeing in a food chain on our posters? And it comes in what we call pyramids. So the first one we're going to talk about is the number pyramid. Essentially, in ecosystems, we can show a numbers pyramid by drawing the lowest trophic level on the bottom in the biggest box and making it all the way up to a top triangle with the highest trophic level at the top. The reason it's this design is because you tend to have way more grass than you do hawks. So if you look at this diagram, this is a good way to show it in a 2D version. This is kind of the 3D, I put that in quotations because it's still 2D, version of what we're seeing. There's so much grass, so many mice, so many snakes, and one hawk. But as you notice, as we go up the food chain, there's less and less and less. That is a pyramid of numbers. When you build your populations for your posters, you will be designing a pyramid of numbers. Your numbers need to make sense. Your biggest number on the bottom with your smallest number on the top. Unless... Yes. So, a pyramid of numbers, as I fix this, sorry guys, a pyramid of numbers uh, can also be looked at as what we call an inverse pyramid of numbers. It is possible. And the reason is, is because sometimes a ecosystem is supported by plants like trees and trees are really, really big. You're not going to have thousands and millions of trees in one ecosystem that support all life. You're gonna have a few because they're so big, so many things can live in them, okay? So inverse pyramids are possible because producers are large enough to create enough energy for our primary consumers. 
A pyramid of biomass is also something that we're going to look at, and it essentially takes into account the pyramid of numbers. But rather than just numbers based on population, it also looks at the size of the individual. You're going to have bigger animals at the top of the biomass pyramid, okay? So it takes into the actual account of the size of the individual organism. To overcome this limitation of the pyramid of biomass, we use it because it allows for us to look at the overall dry mass and once living mass of organisms per unit area. Again, you can have an inverted pyramid of biomass though. Although the producers are very, very, very small, there is enough of them to create a large amount of energy at the next level. Both this idea of the inverted pyramids we are gonna talk about tomorrow in class. The one that I really wanna to get to is the, this idea of a pyramid of energy, which is so crucial. A pyramid of energy will never be inverted. It will always be upright. Why? Because as we eat, we lose energy to each level. It would make no sense if 10,000 joules would be available at the 1,000 joule level. It's just not possible. We don't want to pass less energy on. We want to pass on as much energy as possible. But because we lose energy to heat, it gets less and less each level. So even though phytoplankton has less biomass, if we look back two slides from here, although they have less biomass than the zooplankton, that was the next feeding level, the first trophic level, we know that the energy amount that the phytoplankton creates is massive so it can support the level of zooplankton that are found in the system. So it's all about creating stability. Uh, so the final thing I just wanted to talk to you guys about is essentially understanding how stability works within an ecosystem. So we've talked about what is energy, pyramid of numbers, pyramid of biomass, and a pyramid of, of energy. So the last thing you need to understand is that every system has to have stability. So the more feeding relationships, the bigger the food web, okay, the more biodiversity we have, the more stable the actual ecosystem. Energy can transfer in lots of different directions and we will have a healthier ecosystem. So that is it. That is the last little bit for this ch chunk of the project. You should be able to do everything in the project up to this point now. So if you have any questions, we are going to talk about this quickly in class tomorrow. I apologize for the interruptions and I will post the ecosystem and the energy uh, quizzes right away here.